The Blue Castle Chapter 3 Breakfast was always the same. Oatmeal porridge, which Valency loathed, toast and tea, and one teaspoonful of marmalade. Mrs. Frederick thought two teaspoonfuls extravagant, but that did not matter to Valency, who hated marmalade, too. The chilly, gloomy little dining room was chillier and gloomier than usual, the rain streamed down outside the window, departed sterlings, in atrocious, gilt frames, whiter than the pictures, glowered down from the walls. And yet Cousin Stickles wished Valency many happy returns of the day. Sit up straight, Doss, was all her mother said. Valency sat up straight. She talked to her mother and cousin Stickles of the things they always talked of. She never wondered what would happen if she tried to talk of something else. She knew. Therefore she never did it. Mrs. Frederick was offended with Providence for sending a rainy day when she wanted to go to a picnic, so she ate her breakfast in a sulky silence for which Valency was rather grateful. But Christine Stickles whined endlessly on as usual, complaining about everything, the weather, the leak in the pantry, the price of oatmeal and butter Valency felt at once she had buttered her toast too lavishly, the epidemic of mumps in Deerwood. Doss will be sure to catch them, she foreboded. Doss must not go where she is likely to catch mumps, said Mrs. Frederick shortly. Valency had never had mumps or whooping cough or chicken pox or measles or anything she should have had nothing but horrible colds every winter. Doss winter colds were a sort of tradition in the family. Nothing, it seemed, could prevent her from catching them. Mrs. Frederick and Cousin Stickles did their heroic best. One winter they kept Valency housed up from November to May in the warm sitting room. She was not even allowed to go to church. And Valency took cold after cold and ended up with bronchitis in June. None of my family were ever like that, said Mrs. Frederick, implying that it must be a sterling tendency. The sterlings seldom take colds, said Cousin Stickles resentfully. She had been a sterling. I think, said Mrs. Frederick, that if a person makes up her mind not to have colds she will not have colds. So that was the trouble. It was all Valency's own fault. But on this particular morning Valency's unbearable grievance was that she was called Doss. She had endured it for twenty-nine years, and all at once she felt she could not endure it any longer. Her full name was Valency Jane. Valency Jane was rather terrible, but she liked Valency, with its odd, outland tang. It was always a wonder to Valency that the Sterlings had allowed her to be so christened. She had been told that her maternal grandfather, old Amos Wansbara, had chosen the name for her. Her father had tacked on the Jane by way of civilizing it, and the whole connection got out of the difficulty by nicknaming her Doss. She never got Valency from anyone but outsiders. Mother, she said timidly, would you mind calling me Valency after this? Doss seems so, so, I don't like it. Mrs. Frederick looked at her daughter in astonishment. She wore glasses with enormously strong lenses that gave her eyes a peculiarly disagreeable appearance. What is the matter with Doss? It seems so childish, faltered Valency. Oh. Mrs. Frederick had been a Wansbara and the Wansbara smile was not an asset. I see. Well, it should suit you then. You are childish enough in all conscience, my dear child. I am twenty-nine, said the dear child desperately. I wouldn't proclaim it from the housetops if I were you, dear, said Mrs. Frederick. Twenty-nine. I had been married nine years when I was twenty-nine. I was married at seventeen, said Cousin Stickles proudly. Valency looked at them furtively. Mrs. Frederick, except for those terrible glasses and the hook nose that made her look more like a parrot than a parrot itself could look, was not ill-looking. At twenty she might have been quite pretty. But Cousin Stickles. And yet Christine Stickles had once been desirable in some man's eyes. Valency felt that Cousin Stickles, with her broad, flat, wrinkled face, a mole right on the end of her dumpy nose, bristling hairs on her chin, wrinkled yellow neck, pale, protruding eyes, and thin, puckered mouth, had yet this advantage over her, this right to look down on her. And even yet Cousin Stickles was necessary to Mrs. Frederick. Valency wondered pitifully what it would be like to be wanted by someone needed by someone. No one in the whole world needed her, or would miss anything from life if she dropped suddenly out of it. She was a disappointment to her mother. No one loved her. 
She had never so much as had a girlfriend. I haven't even a gift for friendship, she had once admitted to herself pitifully. Doss, you haven't eaten your crusts, said Mrs. Frederick rebukingly. It rained all the forenoon without cessation. Valency pieced a quilt. Valency hated piecing quilts. And there was no need of it. The house was full of quilts. There were three big chests, packed with quilts, in the attic. Mrs. Frederick had begun storing away quilts when Valency was seventeen and she kept on storing them, though it did not seem likely that Valency would ever need them. But Valency must be at work and fancy work materials were too expensive. Idleness was a cardinal sin in the Sterling household. When Valency had been a child she had been made to write down every night, in a small, hated, black notebook, all the minutes she had spent in idleness that day. On Sundays her mother made her tot them up and pray over them. On this particular forenoon of this day of destiny Valency spent only ten minutes in idleness. At least, Mrs. Frederick and Cousin Stickles would have called it idleness. She went to her room to get a better thimble and she opened thistle harvest guiltily at random. The woods are so human, wrote John Foster, that to know them one must live with them. An occasional saunter through them, keeping to the well-trodden paths, will never admit us to their intimacy. If we wish to be friends we must seek them out and win them by frequent, reverent visits at all hours, by morning, by noon, and by night, and at all seasons, in spring, in summer, in autumn, in winter. Otherwise we can never really know them and any pretense we may make to the contrary will never impose on them. They have their own effective way of keeping aliens at a distance and shutting their hearts to mere casual sightseers. It is of no use to seek the woods from any motive except sheer love of them, they will find us out at once and hide all their sweet, old-world secrets from us. But if they know we come to them because we love them they will be very kind to us and give us such treasures of beauty and delight as are not bought or sold in any marketplace. For the woods, when they give at all, give unstintedly and hold nothing back from their true worshippers. We must go to them lovingly, humbly, patiently, watchfully, and we shall learn what poignant loveliness lurks in the wild places in silent intervals, lying under starshine and sunset, what cadences of unearthly music are harped on aged pine boughs or crooned in copses of fir, what delicate savors exhale from mosses and ferns in sunny corners or on damp brooklands, what dreams and myths and legends of an older time haunt them. Then the immortal heart of the woods will beat against ours and its subtle life will steal into our veins and make us its own forever so that no matter where we go or how widely we wander we shall yet be drawn back to the forest to find our most enduring kinship. Doss, called her mother from the hall below, what are you doing all by yourself in that room? Valency dropped thistle harvest like a hot coal and fled downstairs to her patches, but she felt the strange exhilaration of spirit that always came momentarily to her when she dipped into one of John Foster's books. Valency did not know much about woods except the haunted groves of oak and pine around her blue castle but she had always secretly hankered after them and a foster book about woods was the next best thing to the woods themselves. At noon it stopped raining, but the sun did not come out until three. Then Valency timidly said she thought she would go uptown. What do you want to go uptown for, demanded her mother. I want to get a book from the library. You got a book from the library only last week. No, it was four weeks. Four weeks. Nonsense. Really it was, mother. You are mistaken. It cannot possibly have been more than two weeks. I dislike contradiction. And I do not see what you want to get a book for, anyhow. You waste too much time reading. Of what value is my time, asked Valency bitterly. Doss. Don't speak in that tone to me. We need some tea, said Cousin Stickles. She might go and get that if she wants a walk, though this damp weather is bad for colds. They argued the matter for ten minutes longer and finally Mrs. Frederick agreed rather grudgingly that Valency might go.